Hello students, welcome to the EPG Part Sala. I am Dr. Sanjay Kumar Chamoli from Department of Physics and Astrophysics, University of Delhi. Today we are going to discuss about a module, Introduction to the Nuclear Physics, under paper Nuclear and Particle Physics. So students, let us see what we are going to learn in this module. First, the importance of learning nuclear physics. Second, the understanding of development of nuclear physics. And third one, the knowledge of basic terminology and various units used in the nuclear physics. First important question comes in this particular module is that why to uh, study nuclear physics? What is so important? What is so fascinating about nuclear physics? So here are a few examples that why you should study nuclear physics. First of all, to understand the origin of elements like how our world was created, how all the elements present in our universe was created, Big Bang theory of the universe, where the earliest metal were synthesized and after that we will move into the heavier elements and in this journey all these elements were synthesized because of the nuclear physics. When the stars were, were, when the stars were made, then the elements up to iron were synthesized into them then in the more mature stars some exotic phenomena like supernova happened and in that case the heavier element or the elements heavier than iron were synthesized. So, to so in order to understand all these things we need to understand or we need to study nuclear physics. Second one to understand the origin of various properties of elements. In the, in the coming lectures we will see that the nuclei possess very many properties which are fundamental to them and the properties like mass, charge, spin etc. And these properties have various applications in common life. So we need to understand the origin of these properties in nuclei. Third one to understand the origin of forces in the universe. That is towards unification of forces. We know that our world was our world is created with four fundamental forces in nature that is with four fundamental forces the gravitational force the electromagnetic force the weak force and the strong force and how these different forces have come into existence that we have to understand and also is there some way by which all these four forces can be clubbed together into a single force which we can say that unification of forces in order to understand that we need to basically study nuclear physics and in the last which I have included that to improve the quality of life on earth as I told you that nowadays we are living in the materialistic world and in this materialistic world whatever aspect of life you talk about in those aspects whatever things whatever material things we basically use in all those material things at some point of time or at some in some form or other the nuclear physics is involved. For example, the nuclear fission for energy generation that means the electricity that we are using nowadays in some way the electricity can be generated through nuclear processes also in nuclear reactors. So this, this thing basically to understand how the electricity is produced in the nuclear fission process, we need to understand nuclear physics. Also, use of radiation technology in medical field, industry, agriculture also. So there are variety of applications which involve the nuclear isotopes or radioactive isotopes for which are, are not only radioactive isotopes. In addition to radioactive isotopes, some nuclear measurement techniques are also basic or also uh, being used. So to understand and to make use of these nuclear uh, nuclear techniques we need to understand we need to study nuclear physics if we go uh, into the history of nuclear physics then we find that the nuclear physics really started after the discovery of nucleus by rutherford in some sense we can say that rutherford's discovery was an ex the, the nucleus uh, the discovery of nucleus by rutherford was an accidental discovery because he was trying to modify the Bohr's atomic model and in that process 
whatever experiment he performed on the uh, when he did the analysis of that experiment then he found um, then he then he discovered basically the nucleus so on this slide basically on the left hand side we have the schematic of the experimental setup used by rutherford and on the right hand side we have the picture of ernest rutherford so in the experimental setup what he did was basically he used um, the energetic alpha particles and he bombarded those energetic alpha particles to the gold foil and then whatever scattered alpha particles he could obtain at various angles he basically detected them with the help of some scintillators and then he analyzed those detections so what he found is basically he uh, uh, after in the analysis what he found is that <clears throat> most of the alpha particles basically were undeviated after passing through the gold foil there were few alpha particles which were scattered which were scattered at an angle at a certain angle uh, with respect to the initial direction of alpha particle and he could find a uh, very few number of particles which were basically back scattered all these alpha particles he found on the scintillator detector placed at various angles so when he plotted when he plotted the number of alpha particles detected at various angles as a function of angle then he found very interesting observations and he basically concluded on the basis of those uh, on the basis of those uh, analysis he basically derived certain conclusions the first conclusion he drew is that most of the most uh, part of the atom is basically empty in nature and there is a central entity in every atom basically where uh, which is which is a positively charged particle which is positively charged uh, because as he could find that alpha particles were positively charged positively charged and a positive a positive charge basically can be repelled or scattered only by a positive charge so on the basis of this he could find since he could uh, detect on uh, the alpha particles at various angles so he basically considered that the central entity which is scattering the alpha particles must be of positive nature and on the basis of that he basically uh, he basically named that central entity as the nucleus because it was in the center of the uh, center of the atom so he named it nucleus and then he considered that nucleus is basically a positive charge nucleus is basically a positive positively charged another thing he considered is So on the basis of experiment <clears throat> another thing he considered is that almost all the mass of the atom lies in its center that is in the central entity he named as nucleus so he considered that almost 99.99% mass of the atom is concentrated only in this in this central entity called nucleus so basically he uh, he basically came across the term nucleus and then after that whatever basically uh, the study we have about the nucleus that study basically uh, was started after the discovery of nucleus composition of nucleus the issue of electron now after the discovery of radioactivity by henry becquerel in 1896 it was thought that the nucleus is composed of a number of protons and n number of electrons the argument explained beta radioactivity but it is wrong but it was wrong now one of the important thing that we should understand that when radioactivity was discovered people thought that there are only three particles coming out of the nucleus that is alpha particle beta particle and gamma radiations and then since there was no concept of neutron which was later on discovered in 1932 by chadwick so since there was no consideration of neutron so after the discovery of nucleus by arnest rutherford it was thought that nucleus is composed of two particles called protons and electrons now why that was considered is because there was no neutron and second thing only two particles coming out of the nucleus in the radioactivity was seen by the people so people thought that nucleus is composed of protons and electrons 
and the charge in the nucleus is equivalent to the total number of protons present in within the nucleus this theory of electron proton this electron proton theory of nucleus could easily explain the radioactivity because the in the radioactivity people have basically detected electrons coming out which was basically beta particle so beta particles which were basically electrons coming out of the nucleus so people thought that electron must be within the nucleus so they could easily explain the radioactivity but this assumption was this theory was horribly wrong uh, due to the following reasons first reason was electrons cannot reside inside the nucleus due to the hazen hazenberg uncertainty principle now hazenberg postulated that in any quantal system in any in any quantal system the uncertainty related to the size and the uncertainty related to the product of uncertainty related in the measurement of size or the position and the uncertainty related to measuring momentum of the particle is equivalent to h upon 2 pi is of the order of h upon 2 pi that is if the size of the nucleus is of the order of fermi so uncertainty related that is delta x is equal to 10 to the power minus 15 meter from uncertainty principle delta p into delta x is around h bar which is equal to h upon 2 pi so delta p can be estimated to be around h bar upon delta x h bar since h bar is equal to h upon 2 pi where h is the planck's constant so if we put the value of planck constant divided by 2 pi and the value of delta x which is of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 so we get the energy value as around 98 mv so in the previous slide we found that the momentum if the electron has to be within the nucleus then the momentum should be of the order of 98 mv now when we convert this momentum into energy we have a relation as e is equal to square root of m0 square where m0 is the rest mass energy of electron rest mass of the electron plus delta p square so when we convert this then we found that energy comes out to be around 98 mv so kinetic energy of the electron uh, kinetic energy of the electron which is equal to the total energy of the electron minus the rest mass energy of the electron is uh, will be equal to 98 mv minus 0.511 mv that is equal to almost equal to the same value that is 98 mv so for an electron to be within the nucleus its energy has to be more than 100 mv however the average energy of beta particle every average energy of beta particles coming out of the nucleus is around 1 mv so this is the highest energy ever observed for any beta particle coming out of the nucleus so since the energy requirement for electron to be within the nucleus is of the order of 100 mv but the detected are beta particles the maximum energy of the de detected beta particles coming out of the nucleus is around 1 mv is hugely different so it is thought that on the basis of heisenberg uncertainty principle it is impossible for the electron to be inside the nucleus now next reason that why proton electron theory was discarded was due to the violation of angular momentum rule now angular momentum is nothing but the total spin of the nucleus now for deuteron we find that there are total two number of uh, total number of nucleons is equal to 2 in which if the proton electron theory has to be believed then there is one proton sorry then there will <coughs> one proton and two electrons sorry mass is equal to uh, mass is equal to 2 and z is equal to 1 that is number of proton is equal to 1 so there should be two protons and elect and an electron who inside the nucleus as in the as in the deuter deuterium nucleus there there are two protons and one electron and we know that the proton electrons are fermionic particles so they are spin half particle so when we consider their intrinsic spin then for two protons the spin the according to pauli exclusion principle they will be half plus half for one electron it will be half so possible spins of deuteron will be 1 by 2 plus 1 by 2 for protons plus 1 by 2 for electron that is either the value will be half or 3 by 2 this half value 
is because inside the uh, nucleus the two protons basically will be paired up with uh, a spin direction opposite to each other so they may cancel they may cancel out so total spin uh, related to the protons will be zero plus one by two is the spin related to the electron so the first value of the resultant spin is one by two three by two is if we consider that the two protons are parallel to each other they are in different states so it means the total spin is equal to one and then plus one by two that is equal to three by two spin so but the measured spin of deuteron is one h bar so it clearly shows that if we believe that the electrons are inside the nucleus or if you believe that proton neutron theory of nucleus is correct then the electron spin has to be either 1 by 2 or 3 by 2 but experimentally the deuteron spin is measured to be 1 h bar which is integral spin so on the basis of this addition of angular momentum also we can say that the proton electron theory was not possible reason 3 means third reason that why the electrons cannot reside inside the nucleus is on the basis of the magnetic moment value of the nucleus so in the expression we have seen that the magnetic dipole moment depends upon the mass if we, if we are talking about the magnetic moment of atom then we use the mass of electron but when we talk about the magnetic moment of the nucleus then we make use of the mass of proton or neutron now as the mass of proton is 1837 times the mass of the electron so when we put for the in order to calculate the magnetic dipole moment of nucleus when we put the mass of proton we find that the magnetic dipole moment for the nucleus is roughly 1 upon 1837 times the magnetic dipole moment for atom so it means if the atom has to be it means if the atom has to be within the nucleus then its magnetic moment then then the magnetic moment of the nucleus must be comparable to the magnetic dipole moment of atom but this is not the case experimentally also nuclear magnetic moments are found to have very very small value so as the mag measured magnetic moment of nuclei are very much less than the magnetic moment of electron so the electron cannot reside inside the nucleus Next important reason that why the electron cannot reside inside the nucleus is the stability of nucleus with both proton and electron inside. This is an issue because electron is negatively charged, proton is positively charged. So if they, these two particles are within the nucleus, then definitely Coulombic force will attract them and the nucleus cannot survive because the proton and neutron will collapse and in that case, the whole nucleus will collapse so if electron has to be within the nucleus then a very strong force even stronger than the electromagnetic force would be needed to bound them yet no evidence of any strong force between the proton and atomic electrons exist composition of nucleus discovery of neutron so as in the previous slides we have seen previous uh, theory of electron proton inside the nucleus was uh, having some serious consequences and could not be justified on the basis of various issues so people started looking beyond that theory and in that process the neutron was discovered now new the discovery of neutron basically can be related to two important experiments first by Juliet and Curie in Paris in 1925 in this experiment what they did basically they bombarded the beryllium foil with energetic alpha particles and then they found that the reaction was like alpha particle that is helium at helium double ionized helium nucleus plus beryllium will give you 12 carbon plus 6 plus 1 neutron now whatever what they did in the, in the on the left hand side we have uh, the, the schematic of the setup they used so in the schematic it is clear that the alpha particles are coming from the box they are hitting the beryllium foil and then they after hitting the beryllium foil whatever things are produced whatever radiations or particles are produced they are hitting the paraffin the, the foil of paraffin the slab of paraffin paraffin means wax 
and then after that whatever is coming out they detected it with the help of some electrical setup uh, with the help of some some detector so now what they concluded on the basis of this uh, uh, whatever they have collected in the detector they concluded something juliet and curie showed that this radiation means which is emitted out of the reaction of alpha particle with beryllium was able to knock protons out of paraffin but they misinterpreted the process as scattering of gamma rays on protons similar to the compton effect scattering of gamma ray on electrons because the the compton effect was discovered much before the discovery of neutrons so they basically thought that the invisible radiation which is committed which is coming out of the beryllium foil after having uh, 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 due to the reaction of alpha particle with beryllium they thought that this is basically the uh, these are basically the energetic gamma this radiation is basically the energetic gamma ray and this energy energetic gamma ray is basically uh, this basically uh, this energetic gamma ray is knocking out of the uh, knocking out the protons from the paraffin similar to what we have seen in case of compton effect that the gamma ray is basically knock out electrons from the orbit in an atom composition of nucleus discovery of nucleon so this slide is in continuation to the previous slide in the previous slide we could see that joliet and curie performed an experiment and they obtained some results and on the basis of the results they equated they equated the invisible particle coming out of their experiment as equivalent to as the as the as the gamma energetic gamma rays and basically they considered that these gamma rays are energetic enough to emit protons similar to what the people have seen in case of compton effect now chadwick in cambridge in 1932 he also did the same experiment but he did a small change in it he used the same reaction that is alpha particles uh in on the left hand side uh you can see in the in the in the block diagram you can see that uh, the experimental setup uh, has been given so he basically uh, there is a chamber in which the polonium source is there which is a source of alpha particle and then the beryllium slab is there beryllium foil is there so alpha particles hit the beryllium foil and then the invisible radiations come out and then again he used the paraffin wax slab and after the paraffin wax slab whatever is coming out whatever radiations or particles are coming out they have been detected by the ionization chamber now what smart move chadwick did as compared to the previous experiment that he every time he replaced this paraffin by several other materials and then he basically detected the radiations and on the basis of that he concluded something so the first important difference between the earlier experiments and the chadwick experiment is that chadwick used ionization temp chamber to measure ionization and the length of the track then he used several materials hydrogen helium lithium etc on the way of radiation from beryllium so this was an important uh, difference then particles ejected from hydrogen the particles ejected from hydrogen were like protons with a speed of 3.2 in 10 to power 9 cm per second so remember in the previous previously people used paraffin wax all the time but chadwick removed this paraffin wax uh, slab by several other material that is hydrogen helium lithium and in that process he found that the particles ejected from the hydrogen were like protons with a speed 3.2 in 10 to power 9 cm now he also concluded that when he replaced the the foil by heavier material, materials like helium lithium etc he found that particles ejected from heavier targets had larger ionizing power and were in each case recoil ions of the element so this was a very important observation he made so students as we have seen that chadwick used the same experimental conditions as used by the other researchers prior to him except with few differences like he used the slabs of many different materials to test the interaction of the invisible radiation 
with matter and second thing he used ionization chamber to detect the outcome of that reaction and he specific, specifically detected proton with a speed of 3.29 cm so then on the basis of his observation basically he he basically analyzed the result and then he concluded that if a proton is ejected due to the scattering of photon on nucleus then to speed it up to 3.29 cm per second a 52 mev photon is needed this is very important and this exceeded all known energies of photon limited by emitted by nuclei it means the maximum known energy whatever is emitted from a nucleus was very much less than the energy of the photon required to emit one proton from the wax slab so it means it was impossible for a photon to emit a proton then if it was not photon because it was invi invisible that is why the people thought of photon but if it is if it is not photon then what else all difficulties disappeared when he assumed that the particle is a neutral one with mass identical to proton so it means he rather than considering uh, or rather than going in the same logic of considering it like foot like a photon he termed it as that it's not a radiation photon uh, it, uh, like like photon but it is actually a particle a neutral particle which is having the same mass as the mass of the proton and then he named it as neutron because it was a neutral particle and the and the the existence of that neutral particle he proved mathematically also by his calculations so chadwick called this neutral particle as neutron in a letter to nature in february 17 1932 so he published his results in nature journal in february 17 1932 and on the basis of his on the basis of this work he was awarded the nobel prize in 1935 so after the chadwick's discovery nucleus uh, composition neutron neutron uh, sorry the nucleus got its composition as the neutron and proton inside it our understanding of the nuclei so far now since the discovery of nucleus by rutherford <clears throat> since the discovery of nucleus by rutherford very many number of nuclei have been discovered so far in total that is the data the data that i will be showing here is up to year 2010 that around 6000 nuclei are predicted to exist and out of these 6000 nuclei 3000 have already been discovered that is they have they already either they already exist in the universe or they have been created under lab conditions so 3000 are the known number of nuclei 6000 are the total number of nuclei predicted by various theories or models now when we plot these nuclei that is 3000 6000 nuclei as a function of proton number or in the plot of proton number versus neutron number then we come across a chart which is called a segre chart now in this segre chart we can find various interesting things now as you can see in the picture now as you can see in the picture we have a black dark dotted line in the center which is called the which which shows basically the line in which all the stable nuclei are plotted then beyond this uh, beyond means on the top of that uh, uh, line of stability we have the proton drip line and the neutron drip line on 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 the lower side now in between the proton drip line in between the proton drip line and the stable nucleus there are unstable nuclei which are having <clears throat> more number of protons than neutrons more number of protons than what is required for the stability of the nucleus also on the lower side of line of stability we have unstable nuclei which are having more number of neutrons than what is required for stability so the proton drip line and the neutron drip line are the two bounding lines 
for all the nuclei which justified that beyond these lines no nuclei can be no nucleus can be produced or no nucleus can be produced means if we talk about the proton drip line it means if we cannot produce a nucleus by putting an extra proton to it similarly on the neutron drip line if you pick one nucleus then if we add one neutron to it we cannot form another nucleus so these are the limiting values for all the nuclei nucle for the nuclear existence now when we move up then we found there are certain other interesting things that is we come across heavier nuclei uh, and super heavy nuclei so all these nuclei basically are predicted nuclei but very few of them have been discovered so far so students in the study of nuclear physics we will come across some very common term which we need to understand what they mean first of all in the nuclear physics quite often the term nuclide is used nuclide means a nuclear species with given proton and neutron number also the term like isotopes is used isotopes means the nuclides of same z but different values of n isotones isotones means the nuclides of same n and different z isobars means nuclides of same mass number a but different z values so all these terms we will get to know when we study nuclear physics also there are some terms will be which will be used like isomer isomer means nuclide in an excited state with a measurable half life then nucleon term will be used nucleon means neutron either neutron or proton then positron is used positron means positively charged electron then sometimes we will use the term like meson mesons means particles of mass between electron and proton and then quite often we will be using the term called photon photon is an electromagnetic radiation commonly apparent as light x ray or gamma ray so these are very uh, common very familiar very uh, common term that will be or that are used in the study of that are used in the study of nuclear physics basic units in nuclear physics now so far we have understood that nuclear physics is important and we need to study nuclear physics for variety of reasons now when we study nuclear physics then since we need to measure various properties of nuclei so in order to define those properties in some in terms of some sensible numbers we basically use some set of basic units for example in length the nuclear lengths uh, lengths in nuclear physics are basically defined in terms of fermi or femtometer because the size of the nucleus is of the order of femtometer now conversion formula is 1 femtometer is equal to 10 to the power minus 15 meter energy is defined in terms of electron volt and one electron volt is equal to 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 joule other higher units to define energy in nuclear physics is kev which is equal to 10 to the power 3 electron volt mev which is equal to 10 to the power 6 electron volt gev 10 to the power 9 electron volt tev 10 to the power 12 electron volt in the same way mass is defined in terms of amu that is atomic mass unit conversion formula is one atomic mass unit is equal to 1.67 into 10 to the power minus 27 kg other higher units are one mev per c square that is equal to 1.78 into 10 to the power minus 30 kg one gev per c square that is equal to 1.78 into 10 to the power minus 27 kg it means the nuclear masses can be defined either in terms of amu or mev per c square now time in the nuclear physics basically is defined in terms of femtosecond picosecond nanosecond and microseconds now femtosecond is represented with fs picosecond is represented with ps nanosecond is represented with ns and microsecond with mu mu s now conversion formula is 1 femtosecond is equal to 10 to the power minus 7 minus 15 second 1 ps means picosecond is equal to 10 to the power minus 12 second 1 nanosecond is equal to 10 to the power minus 9, 9 second 1 microsecond is equal to 10 to the power minus 6 second now cross section 
is defined in terms of a special unit called barn. Conversion formula is 1 barn is equal to 10 to the power minus 28 meter square. So all these units are basic units of nuclear physics and they are very useful in defining in defining various values or the values of various nuclear properties in nuclear physics. So students, in the end, let us see what we have learned in this module. First of all, after going through this module, we understood that study of nuclear physics is important not only to understand the mysteries of the universe but also to improve the quality of life on earth. Second thing, the radioactivity was discovered in 1996 by Henry Becquerel but nuclear physics really started after the discovery of nucleus by Rutherford in 1911. Third thing that we have learned in this module that the proton electron theory of nucleus was discarded due to its inability to cope with the quantum mechanics and the proton neutron theory evolved after the discovery of neutron by Chadwick in 1932. Another important thing that we have learned from this module is that the knowledge of basic units and terminology used in nuclear physics is important. Thank you very much.